Many observers wonder how China's economic and geopolitical issues will shape the investment climate in the years ahead and what to expect with tensions over China. Our next speaker, Dr. Michael Beckley, will hopefully help answer those questions and others in the next 40 minutes. Please welcome Dr. Mike Beckley. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> thanks very much for that introduction, Adrian. Thanks for putting this all together. Um, I recognize that we're probably the last panel before the lunch yeah, break. You so start I'll try to see stomach's growling. Okay, yeah, so I'll try to keep this uh, sweet and short. Um, what, what I thought I'd do is, as most of you are probably aware, uh, China positions are sort of in flux right now. People are really starting to question um, them. You have insurers hiking rates, 60-some uh, percent, um, on China-based businesses, especially those that have exposure to Taiwan, and you have some top banks pledging that if there is geopolitical conflict, they will do whatever the U.S. government tells them to do in that situation. And I, I can tell you that the U.S. government um, you know, is, is very much kind of gearing up for a second Cold War, if not a hot war, um, with China. And so what, what I thought I'd do is talk about why this is happening and what it means for the Excellent. investment climate going forward. Um, and you know, as, as you're well aware, you know, China seems to be just becoming more repressive and aggressive on a number of different fronts. The zero COVID lockdowns, the uh, show of force with Taiwan, the sort of expansion of this surveillance state at home, and then obviously the relationship with the bromance between Putin and Xi and the implications for the war in Ukraine. And, but at the same time, China's been kind of opening up and trying to welcome Western portfolio um, investors. And so you have this weird dichotomy of China being this hot investment destination at the same time that it's increasingly seen as a geopolitical rival, at least in Western capitals. And just, just a little bit about me. I sort of um, have been wedged in the middle of this kind of situation because mo my background is in national security. So I've spent most of my career um, in and around the, the Pentagon and you know, working either in, in think tanks or in the government itself. Um, but my wife is a, works for an asset manager here in Manhattan, and so we've had kind of a front row seat to the flood of this money that's gone in um, to China, especially over the last few years. Um, unfortunately, my bottom line, just over the next 15 minutes or so, is actually kind of pessimistic, because my, my sense um, is that political and geopolitical risk is rising with respect to China-based investments, because China's rise is, as we've known it over the last 30 to 40 years, is changing and, and coming to an end. You have the protracted economic slowdown, you have the demographic issue that's really about to bite. And then you also just have um, a number of, especially wealthy democracies, starting to form agreements and mini lateral coalitions that are increasingly getting tough on China, not just on the trade and investment side, but obviously on, on a potential military uh, operation. And so I think a lot of this has to do with the fact that China at this point is more of a risen power than a rising one. So it obviously has tremendous geopolitical capabilities, diplomatic, economic, military. But from, from a growth perspective, its best days are probably behind it. Um, and this, as I'll explain in a sec, I think in my research, I found that these peaking powers are the most dangerous kind of country because on the one hand, this era of rapid growth has equipped them with the money and the muscle to really make big moves uh, internationally. But then this fear of a future slowdown and of impending decline gives them the motive to move aggressively on a number of fronts to try to rekindle their rise or to beat back rivals or just to grab what they can um, while they still can. And we've seen this throughout history, these peaking powers. They don't mellow out and kind of dial back their ambitions. Um, they usually crack down at home to secure the regime. And then they expand abroad to try to secure their economic lifelines um, and accomplish long-standing national aims. And I, I just worry that China's already kind of inching its way down this path, which makes for a more complicated investment um, climate. So just over the next 10 minutes or so, I'll just make two basic points. The first is this, what probably sounds like a crazy or controversial point, just that I think China's rise is coming to an end and its power is peaking and will peak over the next decade or so. And then second, I'll just briefly talk about what I think this means for the investment um, climate. On, on the, the rise aspect, you know, I think we've just gotten so accustomed to thinking of China as this rising country. Like literally, if you were born after 1978, you've never known a world where China wasn't growing like gangbusters. Um, but if you actually step back and look at Chinese history, the past 40 years of peace and prosperity are actually an anomaly. Um, most of modern Chinese history is a tale of warfare and poverty. And a lot of this has to do with the fact that China is an extremely rough country 
neighborhood. It's surrounded by scary neighbors. Um, if you've ever played the game Risk, you know that holding Eurasia is like damn near impossible, and that's basically what China has to do. And um, you know, for a hundred, for more than a hundred years, um, from the first Opium War in 1839 until the end of the Chinese Civil War in 1949, China was basically crushed by this vice that it's it's in by being located where. It's at the country just gets ripped apart by imperialist powers. It collapses into two of the worst civil wars in history. And then even after the country unifies in 1949, China almost immediately becomes the number one enemy of the United States because you have direct fighting in the Korean War. And then by 1960, uh, it's China's alliance with the Soviet Union falls apart. And so China is the chief enemy of both Cold War superpowers. And so as a result, it was isolated, surrounded, and impoverished. And so it hasn't really been until the 1970s that modern China has gotten some reprieve from this, this nightmare. And so, you know, I just think that China's exceptional rise over the past four decades was the result of some pretty exceptional and fleeting circumstances that are now starting to fade away. And so if you had a theory that predicts China's rise, that theory now predicts uh, the peak of China's power and eventual decline. And so one of those fleeting factors is just security. You know, when Nixon goes to China, China suddenly has a superpower on its side, and the United States warns the Soviets not to attack China and then fast tracks China's integration into uh, Western markets and capital. And the timing of that was perfect, because obviously in the 1970s, that's the start of this period we now know as hyper globalization, where world trade and investment surges sixfold between the 1970s and early 2000s. So, Ch so China was able to ride that wave to become what we know of it today as this industrial powerhouse and the workshop of the world. So the first factor was just security, and a lot of that was underpinned by a relatively friendly relationship with the United States. Uh, the second factor is you had a Chinese government that really for the first time in the PRC's history was committed to reform and opening, or some semblance of reform and opening. So Mao dies in 1976. China's leaders basically say, let's not do another cultural revolution, and so they start to reward bureaucrats for good economic performance. They start to open up space for sort of quasi-private enterprises, and then they overhaul their system to join, eventually, the WTO. And so China had the right policies to really capitalize on um, this unprecedented opportunity offered by hyper-globalization. Uh, the third factor is that China, for the past 30 years, has had the greatest demographic dividend in history. So China has had 10 to 15 workers for every retiree in its population. That's two to three times the global average. It's three times, or three or, three or four times what the United States currently has. And that, that one-time bubble was the result of China's peculiar population history. So basically in the 50s and 60s, Mao encourages Chinese families to have lots of children because the population had been decimated by decades of war and famine. And Chinese families oblige. They, the population surges 80% in just 30 years. But then the government starts to freak out about overpopulation. And so in the late 1970s, they do an immediate 180, and they pass the one-child policy um, and because they're worried about overcrowding. And so as a result, for the past three decades, you've had this massive baby boom generation in the prime of their working lives. And they had relatively few parents, elderly parents, to take care of because so many of them had perished in the famines and the chaos um, and, and the wars. And they had relatively few children to take care of because they weren't allowed to have them. And so this population was more primed for productivity than I think any population in human history. Demographers think this alone explains roughly a quarter of China's rapid economic growth over the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, and then the final factor was just China just had a bunch of resources. Um, one silver lining to late development is at least your environment is relatively pristine. It was self-sufficient in energy, food, water, um, and easy access to those resources made growth cheap because you could just set up a factory, plow through the raw materials, heavily subsidized, um, and, and crank out uh, production. So from the 1970s, I would say up until the 2010s, China kind of had it all. But now all four of those assets are rapidly becoming liabilities. And that's why I just think the outlook for China's trajectory needs to be altered. And it's fundamentally changing the calculus in Beijing in ways that have implications for the investment climate. So first of all, China's just running out of resources. Like half the water and farmland is just gone um, because of uh, pollution or overuse. It's the largest food and energy importer in the world now. It's suffering severe water scarcity. Uh, Beijing has about as much water per person available as Saudi Arabia 
does. So some huge parts of the country have literally been turned into desert. And this resource scarcity has, of course, driven up prices for raw materials pretty much across the board. And so each unit of GDP growth for China to produce today is three times more expensive, like requires three times the amount of spending to produce that as it did just in the 2000s. Um, a second factor is just China's running out of people. Uh, the, that baby boom generation I talked about is now starting to retire and they're falling onto the backs of this tiny one child generation. So, and this is not like some long-term thing. That like in the next 10 to 12 years, China's gonna lose 70 million working age adults. So that's the population of France. Um, and it's gonna gain uh, a Japan-sized population of pensioners, 120 to 130 million elderly retirees just in the next 10 to 12 years. That 10 to 15 to one ratio I talked about earlier will collapse to two workers to support every retiree just by the late 2030. So this is coming at China very quickly. Um, and dealing with these problems is gonna be difficult because China is now ruled by uh, a dictator who, you know, that wouldn't be so bad if Xi Jinping was sort of a savvy economic reformer, but he's shown time and again that he will sacrifice economic efficiency if it enhances his political power. Obviously the zero COVID lockdowns are the easiest manifestation of that, but there's many, many others. And then the last factor is just rich democracies are, are starting belatedly to turn on China in various ways. So the United States obviously is waging an all out you know, trade war and a tech war against China. And the EU, Japan are to varying extent following suit, um, not nearly to the extent of the United States, but I would say the trends seem to be going um, in the wrong direction. And if you just look at data, I mean, China literally faces thousands of new trade and investment barriers today that it didn't face even as recently as five years ago. So it's losing some of that easy access to rich country markets and technologies. And these headwinds are already starting to bite. You know, just over the last 10 years, China's growth rates, they dropped by half between 2010 and 2019. Then COVID came along, obviously dragged down the growth rate by another two thirds. And now with zero COVID, I mean, who knows what the real growth rate is in China's economy this year that isn't just stimulus spending by the government. Um, productivity, what you really need to generate wealth is down 12% over the last decade. So that means China's spending more and more to produce less and less. And it, the ramifications are all over the place. I mean, youth unemployment is at 20% and rising. Uh, the property sector, where 70% of China's household wealth is wrapped up in, is starting to um, have a serious crisis right now. And, and China's debt has ballooned eightfold just over the last decade. And so in my research, I do a lot of comparisons of China today and past great powers that rise and fall. And I found that any country that has accumulated debt or lost productivity or aged at anything close to China's current clip went on to have one, at least one decade of, of a lost decade, essentially, of near zero economic growth. And for China, these economic headwinds are hitting at a time that China confronts an increasingly complex international environment. So negative views of China have surged to levels around the world that we haven't seen since the Tiananmen Square massacre in 1989. Um, and they're manifesting themselves in ways that are making life increasingly complicated for Beijing. So you have the rise of this sort of independent Taiwanese identity, which means there just aren't really easy, peaceful options for bringing Taiwan back. You have a doubling of Japanese defense spending planned. Uh, you have the emergence of these, I think, blatantly anti-China alliances with the Quad, which links the United States, India, uh, the UK and Australia, or AUKUS, um, and even the Europeans suspended their investment treaty and are kind of sending token warships into the South China Sea to, to drive them through waters that China claims as its own territory. And so China is facing these, these headwinds, and so the obvious question is how is China going to react? And my, my fear is that, I mean, the, the good news is, like from a geopolitical perspective, um, where I spend most of my time, it's China, I think, is likely to be a less competitive long-term rival to the United States over the course of the coming decades. Um, but I, I just worry that it could become a more explosive near-term threat because the CCP will be more eager to find new revenue sources wherever it can. It will be more primed to overreact to perceived slights or setbacks to its situation. And um, you know, we, as part of a research team, I've looked at sort of every case where this has happened or you've had a rising power that starts to slow down over the last couple hundred years, and none of them went down quietly. You know, all of them, to severity degrees, tried to batter their way through the emerging headwinds. Several of them started catastrophic wars. You know, so like Imperial Japan in the 1930s starts World War II in Asia largely because it was worried the United States was starting to choke out its 
empire that it had built there and that it needed to either make a big move now or just settle for uh, decline over the long term. Even the United States at the, in the late 19th century, you have this boom after the Civil War and then a series of depressions in the 1880s, 1890s. People worry that all the greenfield investment opportunities on the American continent are gone. And so America's solution to that was this huge surge of imperialism where the US pumps uh, exports and investment into Latin America and Asia. Then it builds a giant navy to defend those investments. Then it starts annexing territory abroad um, you know, to secure its economic lifelines. Um, Russia today, you know, people forget that Russia was a resurgent power in the 2000s, largely because of high oil prices. Then when those oil prices collapse after the 2008 financial crisis, they drag down Russia's economy and Putin's popularity with it. And that's when he starts putting pressure on Ukraine and other former Soviet states to join this Eurasian Economic Union, which would basically relegate them to economic vassal status for Russia. The Ukrainians obviously had other ideas about what they wanted to do. They were, many of them were interested in this comprehensive trade deal with the EU, and we know how that confrontation turned out. So we've just seen this pattern where it's the rise followed by the fear of some impending fall that causes these great powers to become more repressive at home, but also more assertive and aggressive internationally. And I just, you know, China seems to be checking a lot of the, the worrying boxes. Um, it's, you know, domestically you have uh, Xi Jinping's consolidation, you have party officials inserted into every industry, and then internationally, you know, China has extended itself massively. It's doled out more than a trillion dollars in loans to a lot of high-risk places in, in the global south. And even according to the Chinese government's own statistics, at least half of these loans probably aren't going to be paid back, which puts China in a position of having to write off hundreds of billions of dollars in losses or start engaging in debt collection activities, um, which is not going to win at hearts and minds. And at the same time, it seems to be putting more pressure on places like Taiwan. It's already brought Hong Kong back into the fold. So I think the bottom line is just investors, you have, you have to take account of China's broader foreign policy and domestic political priorities and the likely US government response. Because the United States is being sort of triggered by all of these Chinese actions. I mean, you know, the idea of getting tough with China is one of the few things that Republicans and Democrats seem to be able to agree with. And so as China becomes more assertive, the United States may start to crack down. And you're already seeing a lot of movement um, on Capitol Hill about more regulations being put on investors, not just from the United States, but potentially from America's partners in any kind of industry that could be remotely linked to China's surveillance state or to its military um, or to its broader um, diplomacy. And so if investors aren't careful, you risk sort of being squeezed from both sides by both the US and Chinese governments as this geopolitical competition um, comes back. Now, there, are, there will be certain opportunities as well, because China clearly is, it has this epic push for self-sufficiency. They're worried that the world is becoming more hostile, so they're trying to carve out their own sort of economic empire, and they're pumping up a lot of industries with subsidies through these industrial guidance funds. And so in some ways, you kind of know what industries are too big to fail in China because the state has explicitly backed them. And so you could make short-term plays that are based solely on revenue because so much of that revenue will be generated simply by the subsidies that these industries are receiving. But I wouldn't, long-term plays on like great innovation coming out of these is I think gonna be very risky. We're seeing that already in semiconductors where you know, 15,000 new companies suddenly popped up in China to get a piece of the state pie that was being handed out in all these subsidies, and now there's massive fraud, and Xi Jinping is demanding a corruption investigation into that industry, um, and I think some heads are gonna roll. So there's clearly um, some risks now, but if you can parse which ones are gonna be favored by the state and make shorter term plays, that seems to be um, the way to go. But I, overall, the, the climate is becoming much more hostile. And I think it just reflects the fact that China is a, it's a different country today than the one that I think we got so used to observing over the last 30 to 40 years. I also just think we're in a different world now. You know, the post-Cold War era of, uh, you know, go-go globalization and one world, one dream is quickly giving way to just a resurgence. I mean, this is more normal in history, honestly. Geopolitical competition, Cold wars between the, the strongest states in the system, their attempt to expand their, their empires abroad. That's, that's kind of the norm and seems to be the trend today, not just with Russia, but, but China as well. So thank you so much um, for, for your attention. I look forward to questions and discussions from such an esteemed group. Appreciate Great. it. Thank you. And I'm sure we have a ton of questions here. I'm just going to start with one because 
You mentioned it a few times in terms of provoking the United States. I think an excellent example of that is Taiwan. So what, what's the likelihood of a military conflict taking place in Taiwan? Might the U.S. intercede? What are the ramifications of the global economy if they do? That's a, that's a fantastic question. I mean, I think, you know, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I would say there was very little chance of a war over Taiwan, you know, uh, you know 1% or something like that. But, and now war is still unlikely, but it's become much more likely than I'm frankly comfortable with. So I think there's, if I had to put a number on it, I'd say something like 10% chance, simply because... Number one, every Chinese leader has made clear that Taiwan will be reabsorbed one way or another. That, that is something that they have said over and over again. And up until about 2016, China's policy was actually relatively peaceful. So they relied more on trying to make economic overtures to Taiwan and just through sort of manifest destiny, just getting the Taiwanese so dependent on the mainland economy, they thought they'd eventually just bring them back into the fold. But what is, what is made for such a dangerous moment now is the Chinese have realized that that strategy has failed. That uh, if you look at opinion polls within Taiwan, more and more Taiwanese identify themselves solely as Taiwanese and not as Chinese. That's ex especially the case in the younger generation. You've had the political party in Taiwan that leans more towards independence, trouncing the more traditional Beijing-friendly uh, um, party in election after election. Um, and you've also had uh, Taiwan's international status, and especially its relationship with the United States, I think at, at a high, I haven't seen since like the old Cold War days where the US was actively had an alliance with Taiwan and was trying to dismantle uh, the PRC as a great power. So from China's perspective, this is a slippery slope. You know, things like Nancy Pelosi's visit are all part of a broader situation where the United States seems to be sending more and more high-level delegations, selling more arms, trying to up Taiwan's international status. There is legislation pending on Capitol Hill that would do all kinds of things to in increase uh, Taiwan's status with the United States. At the same time, the Taiwanese, looking at what happened in Hong Kong, now don't even consider re peaceful reunification. And so as these peaceful reunification mechanisms have disappeared, China has not surprisingly started flexing the $3 trillion of military muscle it's spent the last three decades building up. I mean, what China is doing in the Taiwan Strait now, and really for the last year and a half, this is the most provocative and sustained show of force we've seen in more than a generation. I mean, they're sending huge armadas of warships, combat aircraft, bombers to surround the island. They fly across the median line. Um, they buzz Taiwan's air defense identification zone. Um, and, and meanwhile, Chinese state media is issuing blood curling threats. They're even, uh, and they're, they're re the, the military is rehearsing bombing runs on full scale mock-ups of American and Taiwanese bases and American aircraft carriers. So this looks very, Ominous, and I think it's especially ominous because China does kind of have a window of opportunity right now in the military realm because it's coming off of about a 10 year period of just churning out warships at a rate we haven't seen from any country since World War II. Lots of ammunition, especially big, powerful missiles. Um, and at the same time, the United States and Taiwan have been very slow to react to China's buildup. So they haven't spread out their forces. They're highly concentrated at these big, exposed bases where they're essentially sitting ducks for a Chinese Pearl Harbor style strike that could basically cripple their militaries and then China could you know, do what Putin basically wanted to do to Ukraine, a quick lightning strike and just take over the area. Um, but I think China has to worry that by the 2030s that option's gonna close because both the United States and Taiwan as well as Japan, Australia have these ambitious plans to basically lay down a high-tech minefield around Taiwan using drones and mines and barges with missile launchers strapped to them to basically any Taiwanese invasion force that tries to come across the strait would be picked apart by this. Any Taiwanese blockade force that tries to cut Taiwan off would be decimated by these kind of forces. And so if you're Xi Jinping, who's you know, going to be in his 80s by the 2030s as well, we should factor that in. Uh, you know, if, if you were going to move on Taiwan militarily, now would be the, the, this decade, I would say, the 2020s would be the opportune time, especially because the United States is about to retire a lot of its major warships and bombers because they were built during the Reagan administration and they are all falling apart now because the U.S. has spent so much of its money on counterinsurgency for the last 20, 30 years and hasn't re refurbished its Navy and Air Force. So if you're Xi Jinping, you might think, okay, in the late 2020s, the U.S. is going to have fewer and fewer missile launchers floating around East Asia. Our military is coming off of an epic surge of modernization. Um, the Taiwanese won't get their act together until the 2030s. So you know, uh, why not? Now, I still think it's unlikely because I think this would be very difficult 
for China's military to pull off. I think Xi Jinping has to. Thank you for ending with that. Yes. <laughs> and I'll, I'll stop talking it's getting now. getting more and more so concerning. I'm, 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 I, I still think it's a very low probability event, but I'm just saying that these conditions create a window in which it's become much more likely than I think any time that we've seen um, in at least a generation. So if it were to happen, it might happen relatively soon, but God willing, it won't happen at all. Right. Fair enough. I think we had a question from the audience here. Yeah, well, thank you so much for these very positive insights. And Adrian, <laughs> thank you for this great agenda. Is there alcohol um, at the lunch? <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Fratchett, EM leaders, we work with a lot of institutions in China as well. Um, one observation and one question for you. Um, I think you're right in saying that China is at a worst possible um, moment right now, especially geopolitically with Taiwan. Tensions couldn't be higher. Um, in terms of COVID, it's really a very difficult moment right now. Also, in terms of property prices and the sector collapsing, I think it's a very difficult moment as well. Um, but all these factors could obviously normalize. And I wonder if your conclusion that China has peaked um, would square with the experience of Korea. I mean, Korea is having twice as much per capita income as China, has some parallels, some governance issues, very scarce resources, urbanization, industrial policy quite active, yet also very innovative and really turns a corner and is still growing and is very prosperous. Um, so I wonder in terms of parallels to Korea, or is that China could just take a step back, reform the property system, and start to re-innovate going forward? I think that might be an alternative solution. Uh, and one question for you, particularly from, from Europe, from a European perspective, um, China is the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. Um, carbon in China has risen dramatically. Over half of the carbon in the world comes out of China right now. And uh, there is a lot of interest in Europe to have more of a global alliance to really build more momentum uh, on the environmental front. Um, wouldn't that give you some optimism in terms of having more impetus to collaborate between China and Europe on the environmental front rather than isolate them and put them in the Russia camp and do absolutely nothing? And wouldn't that be something positive you could see? Okay, these are fantastic questions. I think on is China sort of in early Korea's stages. Um, I'm, I'm skeptical about you for, for two reasons, and they both have to do with the demographics. So first of all, the, the aging crunch that China is going to go through just in the next 10 to 15 years is much worse than anything that the South Koreans saw. I mean, it's just, it's just very, even if you resolve some of the macro issues, you know, like the debt problem, if you unwind the housing sector, which I think Beijing could do just because the biggest lenders and the biggest borrowers uh, are state owned and so you can transfer money around. So I don't think a financial crisis is likely, but it's just very hard to grow your economy when your population is shrinking as fast as China's will be. The, the collapse of the working age population and the rise of the re elderly retirees. So those 120 to 130 million retirees over the next 10 years I've seen estimates that suggest China's age-related spending on you know, social security, the medical system, which has been totally underfunded, uh, is gonna have to triple as a share of GDP from 10% to 30%. To put that in perspective, right now, all of China's government spending on everything is equal to 30% of GDP. So what China currently spends on everything, China is gonna have to spend just on age-related spending um, just over the next decade um, or so. And the second is, so you mentioned Korea, there's other cases that have powered their way out of this so-called middle income trap. Um, and so will China be able to do uh, the same? The idea that you know, if once you pave the roads and you've moved peasants into factories, you have to find innovative ways to grow. You have to educate people and push them through. But I, I actually think China is almost guaranteed to be stuck here because the few countries that escaped the middle income trap had highly educated populations where 75% or more of the, popu of the working age population had gone to high school um, and in the workforce. Whereas in China today, it's less than 30% of the, work, of the workforce has attended high school. And a lot of this has to do with the urban-rural divide. I mean, we're, for those of you that travel to China, I mean, you probably spend most of your time in the wealthy coastal provinces where education is excellent. And some of China's universities are some of the best in the world. So at the high end, China is very good. The problem is the area where you still have population growth is in the rural area. 70% of China's children today are in rural areas where education stops at middle school, unless you can somehow afford to, to ship them off to fancy private schools, which most of these people can't do. And healthcare is, is abysmal. And so there's been studies by Stanford that found that half of the kids in these areas are malnourished. They have IQs below 90, which means they're gonna struggle um, with basic high school math if they ever even receive that instruction. This is all because of malnutrition and, and a lack of um, basic uh, prenatal 
care. And so uh, these, these researchers at Stanford estimate that there may be 200 to 300 million workers coming out of these rural areas that are essentially unemployable in modern service jobs. These guys who, you, who are working on construction contracts right now, if they have to go to a jobs fair and like do some basic, you know, fill out a form or something, they, they can't do it. You know, they literally cannot do it. So how are you gonna incorporate them and get to this next level of economic development and do what South Korea, Taiwan, uh, Japan did? Um, on, the, on the climate change issue, I mean, the, the Biden administration, I know people in the Biden administration that are, that are thinking in exactly these terms, that even as we compete against China geopolitically, we should always keep transnational issues, especially climate change, on the front burner, partially to solve these huge problems, but also to try to keep the lid on conflict. The problem is, I just don't know if the Chinese will subscribe to it in the way that the Europeans or the Americans will want, because even if China eventually starts to reduce the carbon intensity of its GDP growth, it is through its Belt and Road Initiative, it's setting up you know, a coal-fired power plant around the world you know, every, every few hours or something like that, I think was the statistic I recently saw. And so from a legitimate, we are helping to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions, I could see it becoming a point of contention. And historically, it has been contentious because the Chinese say, you fat cats in the rich world, you got to pollute on a per capita basis, you still pollute way more than we do. Whereas the United States and the Europeans then come back and say, yes, but you are the largest overall emitter and you have the most growth. And so it just sets up this loggerhead situation. And both sides end up storming out or hiding from each other like they did in, in Copenhagen. Um, and so I'm, you know, maybe I'm just too pessimistic across the board, but um, I, I worry that the, the overtures that are, that are being made by both the Europeans and the United States won't be enough to really get change in China's policy, and that will then lead to frustration and possibly um, animosity down the line. But I, I hope, I desperately hope to be proved wrong. And I think it's worth trying. I still think it's worth trying on the American and European side, but we shouldn't be overly optimistic about the results. I think we have another question in the back corner. Hi, thank you so much. This has been very insightful. I'm Tom Burgandy. I'm the chair of the board of CFA New York. And my question really uh, pertains to your thoughts on the outcome of the real estate crisis in China. I'm really curious what you think the, the, the outcome at the end of the day, what Xi Jinping has up his sleeve, um, he, you know, so you could just share your thoughts on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very tough. I mean, I think um, the, you'll have these different tranches that'll be unwound um, in, in different areas. So I think, um, you know, people that are connected to the party are gonna be fine and they're gonna be bailed out. I also think there are large working class areas where people will get bailed out simply because it's a bad PR move. But the people that I think might suffer are the sort of middle class folks who uh, don't have the political power of the elites, but don't have the sort of standard communist, uh, you know, uh, emotional story to tell of the plight of the working class. They're probably gonna have to take it, at least some losses um, on the chin. And so those apartments that they've been making mortgage payments on, I think at the end of the day, you know, those probably aren't going to be completed and they're just gonna have to eat the losses that they've had. I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a domestic regime security risk simply because the internal security forces are incredibly powerful and so these kind of things can be squelched out. Even though I know you're seeing in more than 100 cities people banding together and protesting and saying they're not gonna pay their mortgages, um, I, I think when they start to feel the brunt, honestly, of the Chinese security services, that, that could be dissipated. So I don't think Xi Jinping worries about it from that point of view. But just from an economic point of view, you're just gonna have so many people who have sunk so much of their savings, which is terrible from a humanitarian perspective, but also from, from the regime's perspective, that means it's gonna be almost impossible to start consumption-driven growth. How are the Chinese people gonna become powerful consumers when they've just lost their nest egg in the property market and they also have to save up for a medical scare? Like I remember when my friend broke his leg in China, you know, we had to pay for every service along the way out of pocket because like, you know, so much of it is pay as you go, so you need to have money on hand for a rainy day, so you're not gonna go uh, splurge you know, down at the mall. So that, I just work for, if, if you're hoping for consumption-driven growth in China, that's unlikely. And I think that explains why China is so determined to expand through something like Belt and Road to get new markets abroad to sort of compensate for um, the, the lack of consumption within the Chinese domestic economy. We have another question from the audience over here, please. Hi, I'm Ann Khan, and I'm with ELI. And a question for you on China as really the supplier to the world. And what are the implications of all of this combination of COVID, combination of things where the Chinese have pulled back resources because they want to keep it for themselves, 
or just the transportation hassles. I was talking to a friend who imports, and it was unbelievable what he had to go through to get goods out of China. So what does that mean for their growth going forward? Have they become untrustworthy on that? Yeah, so I think, I think the Chinese um, have made a determination that uh, you know, the, the old markets they used to rely on and, and this idea of just being integrated into Western supply chains is not going to last given the, the protectionism and animosity that we've seen over since the 2008 financial crisis and is not great for China. I mean, there were a number of conferences in China in the 2000s when the growth rate was high where the mood was pessimistic because they just worried they were becoming cogs in uh, existing supply chains that were already dominated by multinationals from the United States, Europe, um, and uh, Japan. And so they determined that we need to become more self-reliant and more self-sufficient. And then not only does that insulate us from pressure, we can then use that as a coercive tool to, you know, Chinese state media actually released a statement saying that threatening to drown the United States in a sea of coronavirus because they were going to deny the United States PPE, you know, during the, so much of which was manufactured in China. They've done similar things with rare earths, which we all need for our gizmos. Um, and so I, that's clearly the strategy. I mean, it's, it's literally articulated in Chinese government documents. They talk about choke points in the global economy that they want to dominate and then use that for leverage over other countries, as well as to insulate China from counter leverage from, from other countries. I, th I think now the United States and, and belatedly the Europeans and the Japanese are kind of onto this. And so you're seeing more of a push to try to reshore critical components of the supply chain. The Biden administration set up this task force that is literally going line by line through every industry. But I, a lot of these vulnerabilities are so baked in and you also have to get private sector cooperation. And obviously a lot of American firms don't want to just roll up shop um, in, in China. So I think it's going to be a slow moving process. And therefore, from a strategic perspective, is going to be a liability for the United States. For investors, it's, you still have to worry, though, that the trend is very much the US government is now literally looking around to identify these areas. Yeah. It could open up opportunities, because you might get incentivized. You might get you know, subsidies to basically relocate your operations to Vietnam or reshore it back in the United States. Um, but there's also, of course, risk that if your industry you know, becomes targeted by this relocation effort, um, that you might get pressure from, from Uncle Sam or from um, the EU. So it's, I think you're right to highlight this issue. It still is, from a strategic standpoint, very important. Maybe I can close with a final question here, unscripted, of course. But you mentioned earlier in your comments that over the next decade, China will no longer be the significant competitor to the United States that it once was in terms of the global economy. I wonder if you have a perspective, Dr. Becky, who might replace them? Going forward, who's going to be the biggest competitor to the United States in terms of providing leadership to the global economy if it's not China? I still think China is going to be the largest competitor. Okay. So it's not, it's not that it suddenly falls off a cliff. And I think it's going to continue to be the second most powerful country, probably by far, for the foreseeable future. I mean, even if China's economic growth rate stagnates, they already have big, powerful technological capabilities, a big, powerful military. Uh, they're the largest sovereign lender around the world. I mean, they have so many different strings of influence that they've already built up. And so it doesn't mean that China ceases to be an important geopolitical competitor. It just means that the, I think the image that a lot of people had of like China is literally going to overtake the United States or literally get on par with it as a superpower. Um, I think that is, is probably not the way to look at it. That there still will be a gap in overall power, but China will have advantages in various local balances of power, whether it's in the Taiwan Strait militarily because it has home field advantage, yes. you know, it's fighting its area, whether it's in some of these new, um, you know, something like AI, if it's true that it's just all about getting as much data as you possibly can and cramming it through algorithms and making them super smart, like Kai-Fu Lee says, then China's authoritarian regime may have an enormous advantage because they don't have to worry about privacy rights. Uh, they've already created these data centers that are bringing data, not just from China-based businesses, but from overseas businesses that have partnered with China from all around the world. So if, it, if, if it's true that that's what really powers these technologies, China's going to be a formidable competitor um, in a range of emerging technology spheres. But in terms of just overall wealth and military capabilities, I, I really don't see another country that is going to be able to catch up to the United States simply because the United States has so many lucky breaks, you know, geographically, you've got friends and fish, and that's pretty much yep. all you have to worry about. Uh, it's packed <laughs> with resources, number one energy producer in the world. You already have leading edge uh, companies doing all kinds of great innovation, and the population's rel you know, wealthy. So, uh, and you have, you have 60 plus allies around the world. And a lot of this is just lucky breaks of history, 
and geography that the United States has. My biggest worry for the U.S. is actually more of an internal uh, sort of, not collapse, but you know, uh, rising polarization and tensions that hobbles policy making and opens up room for all kinds of corruption and just kind of, you know, we've seen this with past empires where yes. it wasn't the external en enemies crushing them, it was them turning on themselves and sort of tribal politics and um, um, corruption. So hopefully that won't be the case for the U.S. And we have the midterm elections to look forward to in November, of course. Let's Always give a big round of applause times. for Dr. Thanks. Thanks. Thank Thanks you so much. much for joining us today, Dr. Beckley. Thank you so much. This is good.